Church, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Once again, we are back in the house of prayer. And we do thank the Lord for his great blessings, not only for all of us who are here, but for all of you who are worship, worshiping with us via television. We are indeed thankful and happy that we are once again able to lift up our voices in praise to God and thanksgiving to him. We're going before the Lord in prayer now, and I'm going to ask Minister Walter Miles to be prepared to lead us to the throne of grace. Let us go before the Lord with thanksgiving and with praise. One of the things that we ought to do is always is to remember what good things the Lord has done for us and praise him. And I believe... In fact, I, I think the Bible even speaks of going before the Lord in thanksgiving and with praise. And so as we praise the Lord and pray and call upon his name, we know that God will hear and answer prayer. Let us pray as a church and as individuals as we call upon the name of the Lord. And please remember all of those who are on this prayer list, that God will bless them and touch them, whether they are ill, whether they are going through financial difficulties, whether they are family problems, whatever they may be, we know that the Lord hears and answers prayer. Let us all pray. Again, most heavenly Father, we come to you this morning giving you thanks for your goodness, your mercy, and your kindness. We thank you, O oh God, for being that very present help in the time of trouble, and we thank you, Lord, for being our shield and our buckler. We thank you, Lord, because we've come this far and we have found no fault and we feel like going on. To that end this morning, Lord, we have gathered ourselves in this place, a place that you've hallowed out by your spirit, where we can gather and lift up our voices in praise and in thanksgiving to thy matchless works in our individual lives and in this congregation at large. We ask, O oh God, as we go forth in this worship service, that you will be the one that is manifested in everything that we do and say, that you will get the glory and the honor out of all the activity. We ask, oh God, that your power will come down and overshadow us like it has never done before. We ask, oh God, for those who have come looking for salvation, that you will let them be in full knowledge that this is the place where they can find a turning point in their lives. Those, O oh Lord, who are downtrodden this morning, we ask, O oh God, that by your spirit, you will inspire them and lift them up above the shadows. We would ask, O oh God, that you would point their eyes heaven so they will know that there's a glory far outseeding that which they see in this everyday life. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will manifest yourself in the word that goes forth that souls might be drawn into the ark of safety, that salvation will continue to be the hallmark of our existence, that men and women from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, from all economic stratas, will know that salvation is not a rich man's religion, nor is it a poor man's religion, but it's to whosoever will that will come. We ask, O oh God, that you would continue to draw in the name of Jesus. Bless the pastor. Bless those, Lord, that are on this prayer list. Minister to them as you see fit, and we'll magnify your name. We'll glorify your name. We'll lift you up, and we'll ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. The scripture is Psalms 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Let the redeemed say hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. 
Let the church say amen. Let's give the Lord a great big hand. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now we do thank and praise the Lord for this very inspirational song that our choir has sung for us. And now the time has come for us to turn to the word of the Lord. I do want to remind all of you and of course all of our guests who are worshiping with us on television of our 58th annual Bible conference that will be held here at this church beginning on April the 23rd and will be going for an entire week and uh, that is one day in the week that's one week in the year rather in which I encourage and ask all of the members of this congregation to come and attend every night because we will be having outstanding preachers coming to us from all parts of this country from uh, California from Texas from Maryland from Michigan they will be coming to us preaching the word of the Lord we will be having choirs singing every night and we're just going to have a great time. So keep that in your mind and block your calendar for April the 23rd 
throughout that week, Monday through Friday, and from 6 to 7.30 each night, uh, Dr. John Thomas of Cincinnati, Ohio, a noted Christian psychologist, will be giving a symposium every night for an hour and a half uh, on the Christian life, especially as it relates to marriage and uh, as it relates to courtship and all of those things, the problems that are uh, in involved in it and how to solve them. So please keep that in mind. All right, we thank the Lord for you and we thank God for all of you who've come to us from far and near from this great metropolitan city of Chicago. Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. My subject this morning is the positiveness of the gospel. The first service was similar. Our first service this morning, I preached on overcoming fear. But I want to talk to you about the positiveness of the gospel. And the reason I want to talk about that is because there is so much that is not positive in our world today. This is a time of cynicism. This is an age of cynicism. This is an age of skepticism. It's an age of pessimism. It's an age in which many people's faith in religion has been shaken. It's a time when we have witnessed some very terrible scandals not only among the politicians of our country, but among the ministry, the ministers. We've had some scandalous things occur in their moral and ethical behavior. We've had our share, the Christian world, we have our share of people who profess to be Christians and are not. We tend to call them hypocrites. And these things have tended to undermine the faith of some people. And my effort this morning is to solidify your faith so you will have an anchor, something to hold on, not by what I say as a preacher, but what the word of the Lord says. I want everyone to know that what the work of Christ is solid, is steadfast, it's unshakable. And unless you understand that, unless you know that, you're going to be like a will of the wisp, or you're going to be like a vapor that comes out of a teapot. You're going to be very strong at the beginning and you're going to fade away at the end. But as I look at this great congregation and see so many of you Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, I'm, I'm convinced that the work of God will stand strong in your heart. I saw you as you rejoiced in the Lord. Some people say, well, they do a lot of clapping their hands and, and shouting in church, but what do they do when they leave? What is the church doing? So many people say the church has failed. The church hasn't failed. Society has failed. What society is trying to do is trying to lay it on the church. Well, we, we're not going to allow you to blame the church about your failures because the church is not a social agency. I'm, this is not a red feather agency. We don't get any money from the community trust, red feather, government. They give us not one red copper. And uh, President Reagan cut back all the money, sent it over to build aircraft carriers, battleships. Our present president says, read his lips. <laughs> He's not going to raise any taxes. Then they turn around and say, now what the church is going to do? They want us to pick up the slack. Why well, they're taking our tax money and doing whatever they want to do it. Now they come back and say, now, now what y'all going to do? When you see all these people in here clapping hands and shouting and praising the Lord, you can rest assured that the church is doing something to help others. 
And everybody in here you see clapping hands and shouting, wasn't born clapping hands and shouting. The church is not in the business of reforming people, the church is in the business of regeneration. So when you ask what the church is doing, look around and see all these sinners in here who are not saved. That's what counts. And then we together are able to turn our forces to aid and help in the alleviation of some of the terrible situations that we have. But we can't do it all. Uh, we're going to do our part. But I want you to understand your strength in Christ. And so I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of 1 John. And I'm going to read from verse 18 to 20. Now as I preach to you, I'm also preaching to those of you who don't know Christ. Because I'm going to, when I finish my sermon, as I usually do every Sunday, that I've been preaching now for over 40 years. And every time I finish my sermon, I open up the doors of the church and call for people to surrender their lives to Christ. Because sometimes while I'm preaching, the Lord touches the hearts of somebody. And I want you to know there's a certainty in serving the Lord. John writes in chapter 5, verse 18, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. I want you to notice, as I read these three verses, the thing that stands out for me is in verse 18. We know. In verse 19, we know. In verse 20, we know. Now, the same John who wrote 1 John is what some of our mothers and fathers used to call I John. Is the same one who wrote the gospel. The purpose of John's writing was to solidly ground his audience in their faith in Christ. He did not want them to be unsure or uncertain about their salvation. You know, that's my theme. Assurance and certainty in Christ. I am a firm believer in having a certainty in the things which I hold dear because the road of uncertainty and doubt can never lead to a life of faith. An insecure and uncertain person is like a drifting cloud blown every way by uncontrollable winds. Uncertainty and doubt makes cowards of us all. It robs us of our skills, destroys our manhood and our womanhood, and, and turns us into whimpering masses of fear and leads us down the long, winding road to dismal failure, uncertainty, and doubt is the thing that I want to try and wipe out of your minds so that you will know as children of God 
that as the songwriter said, somehow, some way, we are going to make it. You might not know how. You might not know the way. But somehow, we are going to make it. And that's the way it is, not just say, I'm going to make it as a Christian, but that's the way it's going to be in your life. In whatever you have undertaken, in whatever your endeavors are, no matter who you are, I might not see the way clearly. I might not know what door to touch or, or open. I might not know what button to push or what lever to pull, but somehow, some way, I'm going to make it. You who are watching us and worshiping with us on television, you got to say that in your own heart and in your own soul and to be certain of who you are and what you are and somehow, some way, I'm going to make it. You know, John, as I said, wrote this, wrote the, wrote the gospel according to St. John. And he wrote these words in the 20th chapter and the 30th and the 30th, 30th and the 31st verse. He is now beginning to close this epistle out, this book out. And he says, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing, you might have life through his name. John said, I wrote this for this reason. When we get the understanding of what John was trying to do, and then we turn and begin to read his word, then we begin to see that we can have a, an assurance of who we are and what Christ has done in our life. Note the ring of, un, of certitude. Note the authoritative confidence that this man had as he wrote this epistle. We know. We know. Everybody here is working. Never says, I think I'm working. You don't say, I suppose I have a job. You know you have one. No one is going back home. I think I have an apartment. I hope my house is still there. You know it's there. When you walked in and sat down in the pews, I didn't see anybody check the pew out to see whether it would hold you up. You walked in, laid your coat down, and flopped down in that pew. Why? Because there was in your mind a certitude that that pew would hold you up. You have sat in these pews time and again, and the pews have always held you up. Those of you who are sitting in folding chairs, you did not check the folding chair out. You sat in the folding chair. Last week, something could have happened to that folding chair. A leg could have been missing. A brace could have fallen off. But you didn't check it out. You just sat in it because you're used to sitting in it and you're used to holding it up. I am used to having faith in Christ. I am used to believing in God. I have always believed in him. He has never failed me yet. I am not thinking about it. I am not hoping about it. I know that he is there. I know that he will hold me up. I know that he will support me. I know he will never leave me. I know he will never forsake me. I know that I am a child of God. Now that I'm hoping, I'm thinking. Some of you are hoping and thinking because there's so much wrong in your life that no way in the world you could say, I know I'm a child of God. I'm not just walking around saying you should parrot that. Well, I know that, I know that. You can't know that if, if your life is all messed up and you are just running and jumping and running from pillar to post 
and you're just trailing around and doing all kind of low down and ungodly things, you can't come to church and sit down and say, I know that I'm a child of God. No. That's not possible. But if you have surrendered your life to Christ and have given your heart to him, this passage of scripture is very clear. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now that needs a little clarification. Because it is obvious when one reads this first epistle of John that he did not intend for us to believe that the child of God never commits a sin. Not only does John's epistle disprove that, but human experience proves that. We are not trying to give anybody the impression that because you are a Christian that you are now completely free and pure from all committed sin. Because we know John did not mean that because there in this very scripture, in verse 16, he says, if any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not under death. So right away we know that John did not mean that a child of God never commits a sin. And even in the first chapter, John says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we know John was not saying that Christians are sinlessly pure. But what he was saying is, in sin it's not, the child of God, the one who has been born of God, has been so changed in such a miraculous way that that person who lived in sin never lives in sin again. That person who enjoyed a sinful life does not enjoy sin anymore. That person has been changed, and the change has become so miraculous that the word of God speaks to him as being a new creation in Christ, a new man, a new woman, a a new person. Why? Because God has come in that person's life. And I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit of God does something for us. And you need to understand that. We need not to go through life with our heads hung down and feeling as if nothing is coming together. As I look out over this great congregation numbering in the thousands right now, I know that every one of you, every single one of you has a problem that you're dealing with. There's none of you here who are problem free. I'm not problem free, and I don't think that you're problem free. If you are problem free, praise God, I thank you for it. But there's a whole much, but very few folk that I know of who come to this church are free of all problems. But the difference between us and a whole lot of folks is that we have a firm confidence. We have a belief. When they sang this song and you all stood and waved your hands, this was not something that we had orchestrated. I didn't get up and say, all right, everybody stand up and everybody wave your hands and let us all jump around and let us all shout all of this was done because you felt the power of the Lord you know what God has done for you and you sit down in that seat and you hear the song go forth it's not so much the music of the song it's that's why I come out tell these organists don't keep on playing when every time for me to preach because as long as you play folks are going to keep on clapping folks are going to keep on doing something and I don't want you to be shouting and running up and down these aisles because music is playing and when the Holy Ghost is over with I want you to sit down and I don't want my drummers and I don't want the organist to keep on playing and keep on keep on keeping on somebody say to me say oh Bishop you quenching the spirit you won't let the people shout you don't believe in it don't tell me I won't let them shout don't tell me I don't believe in it I believe in it with all my heart I believe in the anointing of the Holy Ghost and if you want to run up and down these aisles that's fine but I want you to run up and down these aisles by the power of the Holy Spirit and not because my organist plays well Praise the Lord, organist. I'm not knocking the organist. <laughs> I got a good organist and I'm not knocking him. Praise the Lord. I don't want him to go home mad because Bishop over there talking about the organist. No, no, I'm, that's not my point. My point is that people respond not to music so much, but they respond to what they hear in those words. Yes, the music is beautiful. responded to music but those words and it touches somebody's heart and they know who they were when I look out over this congregation I look at some of you who I know the kind of life that you live before you got saved me, me, me being the pastor many of you come and talk to me and when I look out over here and see the narcotics addicts and the cocaine addicts and the heroin addicts who you would never believe ever did any of that 
When I look out of congregation and see you and know what God has done for you and know how you live for it, how you got up looking for it, how you spent all day on a high, how you went looking for cocaine, how you spent all your money. But then when the Holy Ghost moved in your life, when God came in, when the Holy Ghost came in, cocaine went out. When the God came in, heroin went out. Somebody said, well, you mean it's going to be a, 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 a easy thing? Is this going to be a painless experience? For some people it's painless, but for others it is not. For some people they got to put forth an effort. I'm not trying to wave any magic wand or wave some kind of magic handkerchief and give you the impression that everybody is going to be cocaine free and you're not going to have any desire for it if you get the Holy Ghost. That happens to some, but not to all. Some people, when they're blessed that way, it's wonderful. But others have to put forth an effort. They've got to get out on their knees and they pray and they've got to do whatever they need. And this church is here to give you support. This church is here to pray for you and to work with you that you will get rid of that terrible habit that has wrecked your life, uh, wrecked your marriage, dragging you down to the dust. It's the scourge of this country. The scourge of our people. Drugs. Uh, but the Lord loves you. It don't make no difference who you are. You say, well, Reverend, I, I'm on drugs. That's all right. The Lord still loves you. And the Lord wants you to get rid of those drugs. Somebody say, well, I'm not on drugs, Reverend, but I got a lot of problems. I don't care what they are. I don't care what they are. God loves you. And Jesus came that we all might have a right to the tree of life. And I can tell you this one thing now, and I'm getting ready to close. I can tell you that I am not talking about, you notice my preaching. I haven't been preaching all about heaven. And talking about how everything's going to be over there on those golden streets. Although I'm looking to go there. I'm telling you about that now, I believe in heaven. Somebody said, I don't believe in all this heaven. I believe in heaven mine right down here. Well, listen, brother, if you don't get yours right down here as far as salvation is concerned, you can forget heaven. I'm saying that if you want to be saved, that being saved is not when you get ready to die. It's now. And there is a joy in walking with God that you will never know until you experience it. I cannot tell it to you. My pastor, my pastor long ago used to say, and he had a, he had a, he, this was a, a frequent remark of his, says, I can't really tell you how salvation is, just like I can't tell you how coffee tastes. If you ask me how coffee tastes, I couldn't tell you. He said, you got to taste it for yourself. Now, I think Peter had the same idea when he said it was joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. I can't tell you what it's like. But you know it, it has an effect, those of you who are unsaved, because you can see the saints of God, how they rejoice, and how they respond to the message, and how they respond to the power of God. And you know in their lives, in their, on their jobs, and away from this church, and away from all of you, you know that you can see them, and that they are living a life, and they are going through tests and trials, but yet they are happy, and yet there's a joy in their soul. Why? Because they are certain and sure that there's an anchor there, an anchor for the soul. There's something that they can build it on, something that can hold them steadfast, something that can hold them tight. And that is their love for Jesus Christ and what he means to them. Christ is not dead. He's alive. And he's alive in all of our hearts. So much so that men and women have died maintaining their faith in him. I don't know how many of you have read this 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. You know you hear these preachers. I'm not knocking preachers. Praise the Lord. I, I believe that there's too many other preachers on, on TV knocking other preachers. May God bless them all. I'm not knocking preachers. But what I am trying to do is say that this idea that if you get saved, everything is going to be wonderful and you're not going to have any trouble is a false idea. This business about, oh, all I got to do is just claim it, claim it, claim it. Do you not realize that sometimes you have to go through the fire? And now in this 11th chapter, what we call the, the, the roll call of faith, I wonder how many times have you read about these men and these women of Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and David and Moses and Samson and Jephthah and Samuel. And then the apostle writes that they quenched the violence of fire escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life, others were tortured, 
not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin, goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, in mountains, in dens, and caves in the earth. And these obtained a good report. And some of us, we can't walk with the Lord because somebody talked about us. Some of us can't walk with God because somebody didn't say praise the Lord. Some of us can't walk with, walk with the Lord because they think the pastor was preaching on them. Some of us can't walk with the Lord because they can't sing a solo in the choir. They took my song. I'm getting out. I'm hurt. I'm wounded. I, I'm quitting. Come on, my friend. If they took your song, say, Lord, they took my song. Help me. And keep on singing. Because we all got certain ego. We all got an ego problem. But I'm not going to let anybody drive me away from Christ. Because they took my song. Come on, friends. Those of us who came up the hard way, I came up the hard way. I came up the rough side of the mountain. Y'all come up in a hole in this church now, y'all got it easy. I remember many years ago, I stood up in a minister's meeting to say something. One of the old ministers said, sit down. Said, you're a young man. Said, you got a long way to go. Down I went. <laughs> I didn't get all upset. And, well, I'm not going back anymore. I just took it. I took it. I remember one time when the minister was calling all the ministers up, come sit up on the roster, come sit up here with us. And then he, he looked over me and somebody raised their hand and said, well, there's Elder Brazier out there. He said, let him stay out there. <laughs> so he's a young man, so he got a long way to go. <laughs> hey, what could I say? Some of you folk, man, if I say, let him stay out there, y'all go to some other church. He said, I'm gone. I'm gone. <laughs> Listen, friend, can't you take a little something? Can't you take a little heartache? Can't you take a little abuse? Preach, preach. Can't you take some? And especially if the pastor's preaching for you. Because whatever happened to me, happened to me for good. I became a better man. When I was drafted in the army, I hated to be drafted. My goodness, I, had, I was in the army. I hated the army. I was drafted in that, stayed in that three years. But it made me a better man. I was a better man, a better man when I came out than what I was when I went in. My friend, you're a better person when you suffer something. A little child, a little boy, a little girl who comes up and every time that child opens up that mouth and that mother popping in corn, cop popcorn, suckers, candy, popsicles, ice cream, ah, yeah, whatever, whatever, what else you want, sweetheart? Here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. You are raising a monster. I'm giving you my last shirt off my back. I'm giving you the last meat off the plate. I'm giving you stockings off of me. I'm giving you my shoes off my feet. When they get old, they're going to still want the last feet on the plate. they still going to want you to give them your last dollar. They don't change because they grow up. They get worse. Preach. Preach. My children around the table, and that was a little one piece of sausage on the plate. They said, Daddy, can I have it? No. One biscuit left? No. When I don't want no more, and I'm full, and there's something left, then you can have it. And they sit there and wait, and they're looking at the plate. <laughs> when I'm through, and there's something there left, then they can have it. I'm not about to sit around there saying, you take the last piece, I'm going to suffer. Why? I still got children out here. They, my children out here laughing at me now. They remember, they remember, my friend, listen. But they knew they had a home. They knew they had a father that loved them. They had a mother that cared for them. They knew that when we disciplined them, that we did it out of love. We didn't abuse them. We didn't mistreat them. We didn't put marks on them. We loved our children. The Lord loves you. Sometimes he won't give you everything you ask for. Sometimes he don't give you the last meat on the plate. Sometimes he hold that last biscuit from you. Sometimes there's something you want he's going to give you in 1995, but he's not going to give it to you in 1990. That's why I love that song so much. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. 
I dare not trust the sweetest oh, yeah. frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, yeah. I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. My friend, you need to be saved today. Those of you who are saved, you got a solid rock. John said, we know. We know. We know. And I'm saying to you, my friend, I want you to adopt a position that you know. And I want you to feel that Christ will lead you home. And I want you to, let you, I want you to know that whatever you need is in him. So I'm going to ask our choir to come forward now. And I'm going to open up the doors to the church. And I know you're here. And whoever you are, wherever you are, I want you to get up out of your seat now. And I want you to come down these aisles. I want you to respond to Christ. The Lord is calling. Will you come? God bless you there. God bless you there. Where are you, my friend? I want you to respond to the Lord Jesus. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be doubting. All power in heaven and earth is in his hand. And he will save you. And he will save you for eternity. There's another young lady coming down the aisle. Come on, my friend. This is your day. There's another person coming. This is your hour. The Lord is speaking to you. We are talking about baptism. God bless you, my friend. We are talking about baptism in the name of Jesus. God bless you, my brother. I want you to get up, brothers. Come on, sisters. This is your day. This is your hour. The Lord is calling you. Where are you, my friend? Where are you? There's another brother. Come on, brother. God bless you there. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. This is your day. This is your hour. Come on, you may be in the balcony. If you're in the balcony, come on down. There's another brother coming from the overflow. The Lord is calling. There's another brother who came all the way from the balcony. Where are you, my friend? There's another brother from the balcony. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? You can feel the presence of the Lord now. Have faith in him. Trust him. I know it takes a little time and we're not going to push you. We're just going to take our time because you're in the valley of decision and you're trying to make up your mind. And there are many, many more here this morning that ought to be coming and you will come. We're just waiting for you to trust the Lord. Come on, friend. We're getting ready to close now. We don't want to close without you. We don't want to close without you. Where are you, my friend? God bless you, that young lady.
going to ask every member and every visitor, don't move unless you're coming this way. I do not want people taking the practice of walking out while I'm making this altar call because you distract other folks. Please be courteous enough to wait. Somebody's trying to make up their mind to be saved. Maybe you not want to be, but somebody is trying. Don't distract them. People walking out is like children crying. One baby start crying, all the babies start crying. Now, we want somebody who's trying to make up their mind to walk with the Lord, to know that we're all praying with them. And all of us are together. So let's pray together. We're getting ready to close, but we don't want to close unless somebody's almost ready to come. Will you come? Is there someone else? pray now that God will bless you. We don't have enough room at the altar, so we'll stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, we honor you today, O Lord, for you're King of Kings and you're Lord of Lords. When you work, no man can stop you, Lord. We ask, O God, that you might minister to every need that's represented here, Lord. You know what they are, whether it be healing for the body whether it be financial difficulty, oh God, problems in the home, we know that God, you're by our side. And your spirit that lives in us will direct us into all truth. And it will give us wisdom and knowledge as to how we ought to conduct ourselves. For we are saved, Lord, called before the foundation of the world. And we realize that you are preparing us, oh God, a place that we will abide with you forever. And it's important, oh God, that we realize by faith that you're able to do all things and that all things work together for our good. We will not be afraid, oh God, but take courage. Stand in this world, stand in this life and realize that we are victors. We are winners because you always cause us to triumph. Now again we ask, oh God, your choice blessings upon us. Bless every family, every child represented in this church. Keep us safe, oh God. Keep us rejoicing in you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may now be seated.